My name is Tom. I'm with Baltimore County Master Gardeners. I'm here to talk to you about starting your vegetable garden. Wahoo! In the past, we would have this presentation at a local public library, but today we're going to try to do this remotely. If this works out, we may be following up with some additional vegetable gardening presentations. So let's get started. First, a quick note about Master Gardeners. It is a program within the University of Maryland Extension, which is in turn part of the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Master Gardeners are volunteers, where we are trained by faculty and staff in order to provide educational outreach, such as this video. This presentation is brought to you by Grow It Eat It, a Master Gardener program that has a mission to help Marylanders grow food in a safe and sustainable way. Well, now that we're done with the commercial interruptions, we can get back to our normally scheduled program about starting your vegetable garden. You know, my Aunt Martha would be able to get a tomato plant to grow by simply digging a hole and putting it into the ground. She had a special grace that I don't have. Like most folks, it's necessary for me to do a little bit of preliminary work before my veggie seeds or seedlings get anywhere near the ground. Throughout this presentation, we are going to be covering the four P's of vegetable gardening. We begin with planning. If we do this right, we'll save ourselves a lot of frustration in the long run. Once we have an idea of the type of garden we want and where it's going to be, we can begin preparing the soil. It's only after that that we can begin putting things in the ground. But planting isn't always so simple because what you are planting will likely determine when and how it is to be planted. Once things start growing, we need to maintain them so that they will be producing and then we can enjoy the fruits of our labors. Planning. As any real estate agent will tell you, location is pretty important. Other factors for your garden, like soil quality, can always be improved afterwards. You want the garden to be on somewhat level ground. It's difficult to garden on a slope because the water will simply run right off and may carry your soil and its nutrients along with it. You want six to eight hours of direct sun, particularly if you are planting things like tomatoes and peppers. You want to be close to a water source because you probably won't be watering as much as you need to be unless it is very easy to do so. You want your garden to be conveniently located. Otherwise, you won't be performing other tasks like weeding, harvesting, or keeping an eye out for problems before they get too far out of hand. You want a southern exposure. We'll be talking about this in a little bit. Finally, if critters are a problem in your area, you may need to plan for some protection from them. Choosing a sunny spot is probably the most important aspect of your garden's location. We live in the northern hemisphere. The sun doesn't rise in the east and set in the west. It rises just a little south of the east and sets a little south of the west. Even at noontime, it's not directly overhead, but just a little to the south. That's why your garden needs a good southern exposure. If you choose to put your garden just north of your house or another building, it may spend a good amount of time in the shade. Also, keep in mind that in early spring, those bare wooden things sticking out of the ground, called trees, will soon be sprouting things called leaves. They will ultimately create a lot more shade than you have right now. When you plant in rows, it's a good idea to have them go from east to west so that your vegetables will not shade each other out. Plant the tallest crops, like tomatoes, on the north side of the garden so that they do not keep the sun from reaching other plants. Keep in mind that tomatoes, peppers, and beans need about six to eight hours of sunlight a day, whereas leafy greens like spinach and lettuce may be able to do with five hours. Carrots, radishes, and beets are somewhere in between. Now that we know where our garden is going to be, we'll consider what is the best type of garden to have. This can be a container garden or a traditional in-ground garden. We'll also talk about raised bed gardens and edible landscapes. A good portion of this presentation assumes in-ground gardening, but the general concepts apply for container gardens as well as raised beds. We may be producing another video to talk about the finer points of container gardening, but we'll talk about the basics here. For many Marylanders, container gardening may be the best option for vegetable gardening. Almost any container can be used for growing vegetables as long as it has good drainage and won't cause the soil to dry out too quickly. 
If your backyard isn't convenient for whatever reason, then your deck may be a better option. If your home faces the south and you have a small yard, it may be best for you to have some containers on your front porch or driveway. If you live in an apartment, containers may be a good option on your patio or windowsill. Container gardening has many advantages and may be the easiest type of gardening for a beginner or someone who is looking to downsize. However, containers do require more frequent watering. Don't expect to grow an 8 inch long carrot in a 6 inch pot. You'd be surprised how many vegetables can grow in containers, but you may have to settle for bush, dwarf, or patio varieties. In-ground gardening is the most traditional approach. The garden is directly in the ground with plantings usually in straight rows or blocks. You may recognize Thomas Jefferson's Monticello garden in the picture. This is a beautiful way to go if you have a lot of space. When I started vegetable gardening, I tried to do in-ground gardening. But over the years, my vegetables taught me how to do raised bed gardening. At first, I tried to grow things directly in the ground, but the hard clay soil was not very fertile and the water would run right off. I tried to amend the soil, but did not do so enough. So, I gathered the good loamy soil into small hills and tried to plant in that. This worked for a while, but you can't really grow a row of carrots in a small hill. So, I gathered the hills into rows so I could plant in rows. Well, this worked for a while, but the hill seemed to dry out quickly. So, I made them wider into beds. This worked for a while, but the soil on the sides would get eroded every time there was a big rain. So, I put wooden boards around the sides to keep the soil in place. Voila! A raised bed! It took me 10 years to learn what I just told you in the past 10 sentences. Whenever you step or kneel on soil, it compresses it. This is bad because compressed soil no longer has space between soil particles to hold air and water that is necessary for good growth. That is why raised beds tend to be 2 to 4 feet wide. You can reach into the center to weed and cultivate without stepping or kneeling on the soil. The walls of a raised bed are between 6 to 12 inches high. The beds are far enough apart so that you can get in there and to weed and harvest. I use my wheelbarrow as a measure. If I can't get my wheelbarrow between the beds, then they're too close together. You don't always have to have a wall going around the bed, especially if you are just beginning to garden. But you will find that it does help to keep the soil together. If you use wood, you may want to refrain from using chemically treated wood. There are a number of advantages to raised bed gardens. Soil in raised beds warms more quickly than the surrounding ground, so you can begin planting most things a little earlier. It's important to note that a raised bed's elevated stature will keep your garden from becoming a bog during a heavy downpour. We've already talked about raised beds having less soil compaction and less erosion. Perhaps the best thing about raised beds is that they force you to think inside the box. In this case, that's a good thing. You concentrate on amending the soil inside the box. You water inside the box. All of your weeding is inside the box. This ultimately allows for more vegetables to be grown in a smaller amount of space. There are disadvantages, too. If you are just starting out, lumber and purchased soil can be a pretty penny. Beds may dry out faster than the surrounding soil. Soil is heavy. If you decide to move a raised bed, it can be a real task to do so. An edible landscape can be an ornamental vegetable garden. Vegetables can include peas, bush beans, okra, sweet potatoes, and hot peppers. And don't forget the herbs. Be mindful of chemicals that may exist in the soil around the perimeter of your house or other structures, such as lead-based paint or termite treatments. Also, be mindful of limitations that may exist with homeowners associations. In addition to the type of garden, you should also consider the size of the garden. When in doubt, it is better to start small. 
Keep in mind that you will need to maintain the garden through the hot summer months, and it's better to have a small garden that is properly maintained than to have a larger garden that may not be getting enough care. Here's an example of a plan for two raised beds that are being prepared for the late May time frame. Each bed is 8 feet long and 3 feet wide. There is a 2 foot wide path between the two beds. The tomato plants are planted on the north side of the garden so that they will not prevent the sun from reaching the other vegetables. The lettuce is behind the peppers so that it will get a lot of sun in the springtime while the peppers are small, but will then get the shade that it needs in the summer months once the peppers begin to grow. Congratulations! We've gotten through the first P, planning. Now we will begin to talk about preparing the soil. Why are we talking about this? Plants need air, water, sun, and soil to survive. The one element that gardeners have the most control over is soil. Fertile soil is able to hold on to nutrients that are important for plant growth. Well-drained soil allows for excess water to drain away so that the roots of a plant, which require air, won't be drowning. Friable soil has a lot of spaces between soil particles. This is important for holding onto water and air for root growth. Organic matter helps break up clay and helps keep the soil from becoming too compacted. It also adds nutrients to the soil. The soil pH determines how well the nutrients can be absorbed by plants. If you have an in-ground garden or raised bed, you really should have the soil tested every three years. This will give you an idea of the soil pH as well as nutrient deficiencies so that you can properly amend the soil. Some laboratories will also test for bad things, like lead. Be aware that reading and interpreting soil tests can be a little complicated. The University of Maryland Home and Garden Information Center has a fact sheet that can help you with the process. If you are using nothing but bag soil that you've purchased from a garden store, you shouldn't need to have it tested. If you are starting an in-ground garden, you will need to remove any existing sod. This will remove weeds that could become a real hassle later. There are two ways to do this. You can dig up the area by hand, or you can use sheet mulching. Digging by hand is more work, but may be the best option if you need to start planting right away. We'll talk about both approaches. If you choose to dig a new garden by hand, make sure the soil is not too wet. Dig up a handful of soil from below the surface and squeeze it in your fist. Then poke it with your finger. If it falls apart, it's dry enough to dig. If it makes a wet, muddy ball that sticks together, wait a few more days and try again. Working with very wet soil can damage its structure and result in heavy clods that are hard to break apart. To slice off the sod, push a sharp flat edge spade at a very slight angle through the top of the soil just below the sod. Once it is removed, turn the soil underneath by lifting it 6 to 8 inches and then dropping it sideways. If you're a real enthusiast, you can use a garden fork to loosen the soil beneath this by jamming it in and rocking it back and forth. Organic matter, purchased or from compost, is then incorporated with a garden fork or spade. This method is time consuming and labor intensive. Some experts believe that it is neither good nor necessary to turn garden soil. The next method offers an alternative, but does require a lot of advanced planning. If you need to start planting right away, hand digging is the way to go. Sheet mulching is a popular way to start a new garden over existing turf. This involves laying down thick layers of unwaxed cardboard or newspaper covered with organic matter such as leaves, grass clippings, or compost. You should first cut the grass as short as you can and remove any large plants or deep-rooted weeds. If you start the process in the fall, the pile of materials will be broken down by the spring. You may dig the compost in or plant directly into the new bed. You can start this sod killing process in very early spring, but it's best to use newspaper since the cardboard may not have time to break down completely before planting. After you start your garden, it's a good idea to regularly incorporate more organic matter. This will improve soil structure and add nutrients. Large amounts may be needed for several years, but each year your soil will become better and better. Know the source of your organic matter. Don't include grass or leaves that have been exposed to herbicides. 
Animal manure should be well decomposed, more than six months, and from a trusted source, with no herbicides on areas where the animals grazed. It's a good idea to compost it first, or dig it into the soil during the fall, and wash all produce thoroughly after harvest. Never use pet manures in a vegetable garden. Congratulations once again. We've gotten through the second P, preparing the soil. Now we will begin talking about planting. This is the fun part. Here are some popular crops. What's best for you may be determined by what you like to eat, what is easiest to grow, what is more expensive to buy, and the difference in quality. Some things just taste a lot better when they are fresh from the garden. The Home Garden Information Center has a fact sheet for recommended cultivars. Many of these can be grown in containers, but you may have to settle for dwarf, bush, or patio varieties. Marylanders love to grow tomatoes, and who can blame them? Nothing is better than a homegrown tomato. But which one to grow? The answer may not be obvious. Hybrids are cultivated for special characteristics, such as disease resistance or reduced time to harvest. Heirlooms are purported to have better flavor, and the seeds can be saved from year to year, but they can be more susceptible to pests, diseases, and environmental factors. Determinate tomatoes are a smaller plant, which makes them better for containers. They typically have one large blush of fruit, which makes them good for canning. Indeterminate tomatoes produce fruit throughout the season and usually are a larger plant, six or more feet tall. You're going to have pests, but we'll talk about these later. Suckers are the branches that grow vertically from existing branches. Some gardeners pluck these so that air can move more freely through the plant and cut down on disease. Ripening depends on variety. Tomatoes won't ripen until the temperature of the soil is greater than the temperature of the air for a period of time. You can use mulch to keep the soil warmer during these times. There are a number of factors that will determine when to plant certain vegetables. When in doubt, refer to the information on the back of the seed packet. Otherwise, the Home and Garden Information Center has a good planting calendar that is tailored for Marylanders. Germination of many seeds depends a lot on soil temperature. Once seedlings or transplants have started to grow, they may still be susceptible to frost. Finally, soil moisture can be a big factor. Do not work in wet soil. It will compress and form clods as it dries later. Squeeze a handful in your fist, and then poke it with your finger. If it falls apart, it's dry enough to work in. If it makes a wet, muddy ball that sticks together, wait a few more days. Cool season crops can be planted early in the spring, as soon as the ground can be worked. This includes many leafy greens and many things in the cabbage family. Beets, carrots, and chard can be planted a little later, since they can handle a light frost. Warm season crops, such as beans, tomatoes, and peppers, need much warmer weather, and should be planted after the danger of frost has passed. If you plant things right, you can plant a cool season crop, harvest it, and then plant a warm season crop in the same bed. You can also plant a cool season crop in the fall. Some things can be planted repeatedly in the same season. This is called succession planting. Should you grow from seeds or transplants? Seeds are less costly than purchased transplants, but some vegetables require a long growing season that precludes growing them directly from seed in the garden. You may be able to start them indoors and transplant them later. Things that are usually direct seeded include leafy greens, legumes, or peas and beans, as well as root vegetables. Things that are usually transplanted include fruiting vegetables, like tomatoes and peppers, and many things in the cabbage family. If you are not sure, check the seed packet. It should tell you. When planting seeds directly in a bed, make sure that the soil surface is smooth and level. Otherwise, water will pool or run off, and neither is good for small seeds. Always check the seed packet for recommended depth and spacing. Some seeds are best planted in a single row, while others can be cast over a wide bed. Rows are easier to weed and harvest. Don't plant seeds too deep. A general rule of thumb is to plant at a depth that is two times the diameter of the seed. Afterwards, tamp the soil down gently. When watering, be careful not to wash the seeds out of the soil. If you have seeds left over, save them for replanting in case rain washes some away or a silly squirrel decides to dig up part of your garden.
sprouted plants compete for water, sun, and nutrients. They will not grow to their full potential. Therefore, it may be necessary to thin your seedlings. If you have a problem thinning your own seedlings, offer to thin your neighbor's garden and have him come and thin yours. Use scissors to thin tiny seedlings because pulling them out may disturb the tender roots of nearby plants. Thinnings can be very tasty in salads. When transplanting, be sure to follow the instructions on the label or seed packet for when and how to plant. Typically, transplants should be planted so that the soil level of the surrounding ground is the same as it is in the container. The exception to this is tomatoes. They can be planted deep because new roots will be sprouted from the length of the stem that is underground. If possible, put your transplants in on an overcast day. The little plants can easily wilt and dry out on a hot and sunny or windy day. If you can't wait to transplant, try to put them in late in the day or figure out a way to shade them from the sun. Water the transplants in and keep them watered for the first week or so after planting. Once new growth begins, you can cut back a bit, but check the soil below the surface frequently and water it if it feels dry. A good long soaking is better than frequent sprinkles. Don't be too quick to use fertilizer. This can injure the plant. Wait until after new growth appears. Once vegetable vines or bushes begin to grow, they may need support. This can be provided in a number of ways. Tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants can be supported with cages or stakes. If you're using stakes, tie them with something thick like twine or Aunt Martha's nylons and be careful not to make it too tight. You don't want to restrict the growth of the stems. Remember that indeterminate tomatoes can grow pretty high, so you'll want support that is tall, six feet if you can manage it. Wire mesh is good for supporting cucumbers, squashes, peas, and beans. Peas and beans can also grow on a string tower, bamboo teepee, or tall fence. Whatever support you use, you may need to train the plants as they grow so that they make good use of the support. Wahoo! We've gotten through the third P, planting. Now we will begin to talk about producing and maintaining. Just as plants need air, water, and sunshine, they will also need nutrients. To some extent, these may be already in the soil, particularly if you regularly add organic matter. However, there is a good chance that you will need to amend the soil with fertilizer, particularly if your soil test results indicate a nutrient deficiency. The basic nutrients are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Nitrogen is necessary for leaf growth. Phosphorus is good for root growth as well as for fruiting vegetables. Potassium is good for overall healthy growth. A good way to remember which is which is up, down, and all around. You may see a series of numbers on a bag of fertilizer. The numbers represent the amount of each nutrient as a percentage of the fertilizer. In the picture, you see a bag of 20, 5, 10. This means that the fertilizer is 20% nitrogen, 5% phosphorus, and 10% potassium. What the combination to buy is dependent not only on the results of your soil test, but also on the type of vegetables that you are growing. Different vegetables need different amounts of nutrients. Nitrogen is good for leafy vegetables, but be careful not to add too much or they can taste bitter. Phosphorus is good for fruiting vegetables like tomatoes, peppers, or squash, as well as root vegetables like carrots and beets. Remember to read the instructions. Too much fertilizer can hurt plants, reduce fruiting, attract pests, and pollute waterways. Different types of fertilizer can be added to your soil to increase the levels of nitrogen, phosphorus, or potassium. The amendments can be either conventional, organic, or sustainable. Conventional amendments are generally chemical and inorganic. They are extracted from minerals or produced industrially. Organic amendments tend to be derived from biological sources, such as cottonseed meal or fish emulsion. They are generally lower in nutrient levels, but release them over a longer period of time. Sustainable amendments tend to be organic and include those that use resources that put as much back into the ecology as our plants take out of it. Vegetable gardens need, on average, one inch of water per week. 
when watering, remember to water the roots and not the leaves. Plants use a process called transpiration, where water is pulled in through the roots and leaves through the leaves. That's why they're called leaves. The root zone of the soil below the surface should be moist like a damp sponge. Drip irrigation or a soaker hose will make sure that the water gets to the roots without washing things away. Mulch will help the soil to retain moisture. Seeds and young seedlings need to stay moist in order to germinate and grow. Monitor them on a daily basis. As they get established, you can water them less frequently. Avoid watering at night because this can introduce plant diseases such as mildew. Weeds happen and it's necessary to keep up with them. They can attract pests and diseases. They'll also rob your plants of moisture and nutrients, sometimes even daylight. Many weeds can be easily pulled out when the soil is moist, or you can use a sharp tool to remove the above ground portion. Shakespeare was wrong when he wrote mulch ado about nothing. Not only does it help retain soil moisture, mulch also prevents weeds, moderates soil temperature, and adds organic matter. Add it late in spring after the soil has had a chance to warm up. Cover crops, where dense plantings of crops like leaf lettuce, can also shade out weeds. Not all insects are bad, most of them are good or benign. If you see plant damage, try to identify the pest and determine if the damage can be tolerated. The Home and Garden Information Center has a number of publications for pests in our area, as well as tips for integrated pest management. Some insects can be easily picked off by hand or washed off with a garden hose. Try to keep the good bugs and natural pest predators in the neighborhood. They will gladly help dispatch the bad guys. Chemicals should be your last resort. Be sure to follow the instructions if you decide to use any pesticides in your garden. Much of the time you can identify a pest if you know what planet it is on. If you see damage but can't find the culprit, try looking under the leaves for egg masses or immature insects. If certain pests bug you year after year, you can use different strategies like planting later in the year or using row covers. It's always a good idea to remove plant debris at the end of the growing season so that pests do not overwinter in your garden as if it were a bed and breakfast. Sometimes it is best to tolerate a few chewed leaves. This caterpillar is called a parsley worm, but it will grow up to be a swallowtail butterfly. Well, that's it for starting a vegetable garden. We thank you for attending this presentation. If you enjoyed this one, please keep an eye out for other presentations from Master Gardeners. For more information, visit one of the websites below. The fact sheets and publications mentioned in this presentation are available at the Home and Garden Information Center. If you'd like to learn more about Master Gardeners, please visit our website or join our mailing list. Or check us out on Facebook. We hope you'll like us.